Well, I'm delighted to welcome you all to the Staff Pride Network uh, Pride Month event, Pride in Writing, Sapphic Voices. Uh, we're delighted to uh, have Shil for their last their last event uh, as our social events officer. Uh, she has been fantastic at coordinating many events for the Staff Pride Network, and uh, we're delighted that they're going to uh, spend all this extra time now focusing on their Disabled Staff Network uh, co-chair role. Um, where, and then Disabled Staff Network has been doing fantastic work. So if you're not already uh, a member of the Disabled Staff Network, uh, then um, do email dsn at edac uk. Thanks and welcome to all of our speakers. Uh, it's lovely to see uh, uh, you again, Sigrid. Have a great uh, event and uh, over to you, Show. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, hi. Um, so I'm Sho. I'm a uh, writer uh, from Edinburgh, uh, primarily poetry, though in the last year I have written five whole poems uh, for numerous reasons, which I'm sure I don't need to explain to the people assembled here today. Um, and we have this fantastic panel and what I'm going to do is for fear that I miss one of the many accomplishments because they're really, really good, this panel. I'm going to ask everyone to introduce themselves. <laughs> so I'm going to start with Sigrid, if that's OK. That's OK. Thank you so much for inviting me. I've, we, I've, the Staff Pride Network invited us in 2019, I've, Bob Orr and me, to talk about Lavender Menace Bookshop, which we opened in 1982 in 4th Street in a very tiny basement with a dangerous stair. And it was Scotland's first uh, lesbian and gay community bookshop. And uh, we, uh, a couple of years ago, a play was written about the bookshop. And it, uh, uh, it caught the craziness so well and made a much finer thing out of it that we decided uh, we would start doing uh, public bookshops. And then we decided we would collect the books that we sold, which have faded away in a lot of people's memories since they're 40 years old and more. And I uh, create an archive and put it on social media and try to publicize it shamelessly so that the books weren't forgotten and that they could be connected to the amazing books that are being produced by uh, LGBTQ people now. So uh, that, uh, that's what we're doing. We've been doing it for two years the uh, staff pride meeting really sticks in our minds because it was the last one before lockdown. And uh, it helped us jump into all these Zoom meetings, which now seem completely normal. Thank you so much. At the end of this, I'm gonna, put, uh, I'm gonna ask everyone to, to be able to share their social media um, because um, you can follow uh, Lavender Menace on, on Facebook and Twitter and all these other things, but we've got that for we're going to have that for everyone at the end because I'm sure once this is finished, all the participants here are going to just want to find out where they can find you, other places. Um, and because of where you are on my screen, I'm going to go to China next, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. So I'm China. Uh, I am from the Sapphic Writers uh, organization. Uh, we are a global group. Uh, writing community that offers workshops, publication, performance opportunities, news and resources um, aimed at undeserved community, underserved, sorry, community of writers. Um, we're made of exclusively sapphics um, and we emphasize and uplift sapphic voices in the community. And I am one of their co-producers. Yes. And founding members, if I remember rightly. No, I am no. not. No. no. Oh. You're just one of the people who gets the emails. <laughs> it's very <Yes>. important. <laughs> um, Sabib, can I move on to you next? Um, if you'd like to just introduce yourself and uh, your writing and everything, that'd be great. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Glad to be here. Uh, my name is Sabib. 
Um, I am currently a student in the Master's in Creative Writing program at University of Edinburgh. Um, so moved from America to Edinburgh last year. Um, also to join my partner, who's also a writer. Um, and yeah, I, so my writing spans from like fiction, mostly now to also nonfiction and poetry. Um, and not only am I a writer, but also like a huge cinephile. So um, just thinking about growing up and not only reading, but all the films I would watch with uh, sapphic themes um, that kind of helped me come to my identity. So yeah, that's uh, something I always sort of sought out um, and tried to also incorporate in my own writing, uh, particularly in the novel I'm working on now, um, the first book. Fantastic, thank you. And um, yes, Zabib is one of at least two people who are in uh, lesbian writing, uh, sapphic writing power couples here, um, because uh, Lynn's, Lynn's partner is, uh, uh, Zabib's partner is Lynn's McLeod, who is a fantastic writer as well, and prolific and very organised. Um, and uh, Lola, I guess that's a good way to come to you as well. <laughs> That's a handy introduction. Um, yes, I'm Lola Keeley, um, and I have produced officially four novels of Suffolk romance. Um, those kind of came as a surprise to me as much as anyone else, but they're out there now and they really exist. Um, my wife is, and I'm sure some of you may have crossed paths with her, because she's also a University of Edinburgh graduate, um, is Kate Welsh, who writes historical fiction based in, historical crime fiction, sorry, based in Edinburgh. Um, so uh, there's a lot of fighting over whose turn it is to have the room quiet and who gets to pick the editing music, but um, it's pretty, we're pretty used to the whole two writers working in harmony thing now. Um, and yeah, my, my latest career step um, on top of the books, two more of which are in the pipeline, um, is I have started working in television, which was very much a pipe dream. Um, and then I went and did my master's at Glasgow Cali in television fiction writing. And um, off the off the back of that, I'm now uh, working at BBC Scotland on my first sort of script based gig. So um, that's what I'm doing. I'm just getting my my every opportunity done. Could we make this a little gear? Could could this possibly be? any more queer in any way just so that is my official role in, in any job I have so just just checking do these people need to be straight um and the answer is almost always no so no one um, needs to be straight <laughs> exactly. it certainly shouldn't be compulsory yeah. so um been trying to to spread the good word as it were um when I've been given the opportunity or the audience so Fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for those introductions. I'm so excited. Um, as I've, I've said to all of you, but I've not said to the rest of the people here, um, the structure we're going to go is a kind of a discussion of why it's bad when people who aren't part of the sapphic community try and tell our stories and when that goes wrong, and then a discussion of why it's so good when we do, so that we finish on more of a high. Um, then an opportunity for a Q&A from um, anyone in the audience, and then uh, we'll round up with sharing everyone's social media handles so that you can follow them and get involved in their work. So that's the plan. Um, and so I'm going to sort of ask a question and our panelists uh, can chip in by like, raising a hand or something. Um, when I was thinking of uh, one of the worst examples off the top of my head, I thought of the film Blue is the Warmest Colour, which I can see people nodding at, um, which was definitely written from the lens of a uh, cis het man. <laughs> um, and uncomfortable to watch, but something that I at one point that I watched because I was like, yay, sapphic content oh not not good sapphic content and also just as a brief moment i'm going to take an aside because i've not clarified what we mean by sapphic um and i'm going to use the i'm using the sort of sapphic writers network definition which means which encompasses pansexual and bisexual non-binary and women is that everyone have i 
have I been as, in as appropriately inclusive with that, China? Yeah, yeah. If you identify as sapphic, you are a sapphic. <laughs> Um, so has anyone got any um, examples of when they've been potentially seeking out sapphic content when they were younger and finding things and finding it quite disappointing or uncomfortable? I know that I tended to just read sapphicness into stories. So, for example, I read Anne of Green Gables and was convinced that Phil Gordon, uh, the friend from uni, and Anne were in love with each other because... They, they seem like they would make a really great couple. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> um, so what were your experiences? Were you queering fiction or were you encountering um, any fictional representation that you felt was there? And also, um, I'm aware that we've got, um, <laughs> that it also tends to be white, skinny people mm -hmm. who are very young. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that that's 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 another limitation. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna call on someone to speak because you're all just nodding, and um, I, I, <laughs> and so I'm gonna start with Lola this time. So go back in the other way. Yeah, I think um, the biggest barrier for me to accessing any kind of sort of static content growing up was that it was always sort of referred to in that sort of behind the hands slightly sneering sort of way where it was classed as you know pornography or there couldn't be any sort of non-sexual context for it so the immediate answer if you dared to wonder why there couldn't be something with two women who were together or two guys who were together was always well you're too young you, you can mm -hmm. you can't know about that because that's only for grown-ups um which I really didn't think we'd be having that debate again but yeah here we go um so yeah that was the biggest barrier and also you know a lot of stuff wasn't you know, like checking books out from the library and stuff. They were all marked as adult fiction and um, you couldn't get access to it unless you had a parent or older person who would like to get it on their card for you, stuff like that. Um, so that, that was a big sort of stepping barrier. And then so it meant the first things I did find were kind of through that, that lens. And it was always very, but how is this interesting to men or how is this interesting and to, to cis men in particular, I obviously come to see that as, but um, it just made me kind of feel like an outsider to something which I was obviously in the process of realizing was part of my own you know identity in life and mm -hmm. it's very strange to to come across something which you think aha suddenly it all makes sense but it feels like you're standing outside the room looking in through a window and going I don't think we're, I don't think you're doing that right I don't think that's how two women would relate to each other in this in this situation you know and a lot of very contrived um you know the cheating bisexual trope the man you know women always go back to men trope all of those kind of uh historically not great narratives for us as a community both in real life and fiction um, those were the first stories that I came across and it really just left me <laughs> hoping for better I suppose really and you know if I wasn't going to find it I was going to have to do it those were the only two options so I was gonna to have to write it or I was gonna to have to find someone else who was writing it and, and that's how we ended up here I think. Yeah um Sabib um was that a similar experience for you? Um yeah in some ways also different in other ways um because I think I had this interesting experience where I went uh, in America uh to a, a private all-girls school um that was very white but also strangely progressive um, so I remember there was a semester I was, I was living on campus and, um, they, the school was very, um, LGBT friendly. Um, so we would watch queer movies sometimes with, uh, like the dorm mom. So I remember watching, but I'm a cheerleader for the first time. And then also a really inappropriate movie, I think to watch with like <laughs> your teacher, but, uh, uh, better than chocolate. I don't know if you haven't seen that. Um, <laughs> we watched it all together. So uh, that was that was great. Like that was a great introduction to like kind of um, seeing sapphic love or desire at, as something you would see in the movies and acceptable and amazing. And then I think uh, over time, obviously, like when I graduated, like college was not 
like that. It was almost like 10 steps backwards. Um, so I think a lot of the content, first of all, yes, it's predominantly white. And then a lot of the, the content initially that I was watching was uh, centered around gay men. So in a way it kind of felt like, oh, um, being engaged with uh, queer love stories, but that it was removed in that way from my experience. Um, so yeah. And then, you know, over the years I've watched so many <laughs> sapphic love stories and books and things. So yeah, there, I think there are good examples. And then sometimes, the, and I, I was going through the examples before this and they were like all white. <laughs> like the only, um, uh, in terms of like films, let's say the only uh, black sapphic story I could find that I had watched that I liked was Pariah. And that's like so, it has so much trauma in it too. So uh, yeah, it's a challenge. Yeah, um, uh, if you, uh, there's, there's also a New York Christmas wedding, which starts really disappointingly with her about to marry a man, which really threw me off. Oh, I didn't realise, but um, that's got mixed production and also quite a lot of trauma, because uh, apparently um, if, we, if we don't have to have uh, queer trauma, we have to have black trauma. Um, is that something you found as well, China? Yeah, I I remember growing up, uh, I read a lot of comics like DC and Marvel. And, you know, some of the first issues that had, you know, black characters, it's often like something traumatizing that starts off their journey of why they're a hero. And so when we eventually get to having, you know, these queer and sapphic characters who are heroes it's the same thing all over again so I I felt like I was like kind of stuck in a place where I love these these stories but also I am getting too much trauma from the black stories but also the queer stories so it just it it never got easier until you know recently yeah um and then I guess I want to go to Sigrid it has has it always been so this way <laughs> Is this your uh, experience? Well, I've, uh, I've, 50 years ago, I've, you had a hard time getting a hold of these things. And once you got a hold of them, I, you, I, it, I've, it was even more depressing than trying to get a hold of them and not being able to. The, the one that really bugged me, uh, which I've, I've just written a blog about six homophobic authors on Lavender Menace's website. And one of them, of course, was the obvious example, uh, D.H. Lawrence, who uh, was uh, rapidly anti-gay and uh, anti-LGBT. And But what I found out was there was a novel he wrote called The Rainbow, and there were two women in it, even though it was great literature. So I managed to get a hold of it. And his description, uh, the heroine Ursula, uh, gets off with her teacher. And as far as it goes, it's uh, beautifully written and they have a good time. But of course, then the teacher dumps her and she marries a rich man. And when we see her again, she's spiritually dead. And that's all of uh, Lawrence's uh, bisexual or uh, queer characters uh, suffer this kind of fate. He, uh, he began to develop a theory about how it was taking over the world. And I, I think he got uh, uh, more and more unhappy about that and probably he deserved to. But uh, more recently, uh, I, I was reading a book called Sita by Kate Millett, which I don't know if everybody has heard of because it, uh, it was published in 1977, and it's, uh, despite the fact that Kate Millett is still well known, it's uh, utterly faded away. And it really disturbed uh, women I knew in the book trades because it has all the cliches about lesbian relationships written by a bisexual woman. She blames her lover for uh, being cruel to her and finally abandoning her. And uh, a lot of people attack Kate Millett and 
she said, oh, I wanted to write about disappointment and love. Surely I'm allowed to do that. It really happened. Uh, anyway, I was channeling Marcel Proust. So I, I actually looked at the fifth volume of uh, Remembrance of Things Past, uh, which very few people ever get to. Um, and I, I, I've only got to the third. <laughs> and uh, it is uh, in the fifth volume and the fourth volume, Proust falls in love with a whole gang of girls uh, in a resort town. And his description of them is fascinating. Uh, they, they just wander through the town like a bunch of, like a 50s gang in their leather jackets terrorizing old men, uh, uh, invading the bandstand. And uh, because his hero, Marcel, has been disappointed in love, he thinks, wow, I, I want to do something really cheap. So he falls in love with the leader of the gang, who's called Albertine. And she, of course, is named after his chauffeur, Albert. And uh, you can... Uh, you can guess what you want to about all that. But uh, he manages to persuade Albertine to come to Paris with him uh, to get her away from her girlfriends because he's sure she's having affairs with all of them. But taking her to Paris is even worse because she goes out on the streets and she meets the eyes of other girls. And you can see an assignation is being planned. It is, uh, there's something it's it's really uh, quite an exciting fantasy of these bitches in corsets and long skirts striding through the parks in Paris, handing each other notes that say, uh, 3 p.m. be there. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just utterly unlikely. Uh, but I I only discovered that recently, and uh, I'm glad I'm able to laugh at it now. Uh, it, even though what it shows is that even somebody like Proust, who had a very sophisticated set of friends, he knew nothing about lesbians, whatever. It was all bizarre fantasy that he probably read in cheap books passed under the counter. Yes, I think it's interesting. I think one of the things I, th I think that's felt like a theme about this is that when it's, it's written, um, by by men or for a male audience that we don't feel like it's our story that that was the thing I got like Lola, Lola's lovely image of like looking at it from the window outside and going oh oh that that's nearly it compared to experiences like seeing but I'm a cheerleader in a room full of people who were also watching it therefore not making it feel furtive that's just such a different experience and trying to sort of like square that circle and then the whole fact that um, I personally have found uh, a problem when um, cis het people write uh, queer stories they feel that it's very important that they put as much trauma in as possible. Um, I, I recently read a novel where someone had lost their partner because they'd been attacked by a group of people for being gay having whilst having sex and then their partner had died and I just, just was like I don't know any queer people who would write this in a story, a love story. Because we don't, we, we know that this stuff happens. We don't need to ram it down anyone's throats. <laughs> and that's, I think, sometimes the thing that we find or the uh, famous Saturday Night Live sketch, which I'm sure we've all seen now, um, where it's big lesbian film. Uh, it's two white people, it's in history. They stare longingly at each other. There are six words of dialogue in the entire film and an incredibly long sex scene that shows it has to have been written, but been directed by a man. And I was like, yeah, that's pretty much a lot of them. It's, it's not all of them. Portrait of a Lady on Fire, I think, was, was, was not quite that. Uh, though, again, it was uh, skinny white people in history. <laughs> which is uh, appar apparently think, how we're yeah. allowed to be tell our stories. I think that's probably what you just set, set me off on half an idea there. But um, I think the biggest thing about being told not as own voices is the lack of imagination. Because for most people, I think it's just like people, when they tell our stories, they tell it at the intersection 
where it re intersect with their lives, which is mostly coming out narratives and trauma. Yeah. It's when things go badly wrong and when, you know, when we need a wider community to help or to step in in some way. So stuff like political movements and like getting the vote and getting same sex marriage, that's like feel good kind of, oh yeah, we were the good guys. We got to really help you with that. But the there's a sort of, when you look at the depth of movies and books and everything else about like street people's experiences, they're just, you can't even begin to name or to number them. It's every detail of such different diverse lives. And then when it comes to us, it's like, yeah, you can come out or you can get dumped or you can like, you know, it can all go horribly wrong, but these are like your three options. And I think that's where sort of reclaiming the, the space has become, you know, people are telling their own stories and going, hey, do you know what? We have complicated marriages and difficult relationships with our kids. And, you know, we also We do can be happy. Cool things. Yeah, we, we jump off cliffs for fun and, you know, we go skydiving like everyone else can. It's just, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of my um, bugbears that I occasionally shout about, and I know that we should have room for the for the trauma and the tragedy, but because we don't have enough stories mm. of our own being told, I often want to shout, I just want a film that has two <laughs> happy, successful, emotionally, financially, sexually fulfilled women at the end of it, rather than them all being really sad or <laughs> dead. Yeah. Or married. Or, or yeah, or, or married to men, yeah. <laughs> the, the wonderful. Basically, range. you you want something where you're not tired at the end of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that feels like a good space to move into talking about the fact that there's so much more now. There are so many more versions of stories. Um, it's really exciting looking at young adult fiction. Um, a book I read last summer was um, the Summer of Geor Geordie Perez and the Best Hamburger in. LA and it was the central character is just fat and lesbian like it's just like I am a fat lesbian that's just who I am <laughs> uh there's this really cute girl I'm falling for her there was there was there was edges of people having issues with it but that wasn't the bulk of the story the bulk of the story was that she was there and she really loved clothes and Geordie was really into art and stuff. It, it got to just be a teenage love story. And um, I just went to do a little dance when I read it because teenage love story where it's not a traumatic coming out story. It's such, it's such a cute story because like oftentimes with, you know, coming of age stories, it's just very cis, white, female, you know, straight to the bone, like, there's one way but with this story it was very cute and very heartwarming to see like oh I love clothes I am fat but that's fine yeah it was it was really really um it, it, it's one of my favorites that I've read recently which is why I brought it up um of uh the in the young adult sphere because it makes me excited that teenagers are getting to read books like that uh, rather than some of the stuff that we all had to read. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was wondering, um, and one of the places that's creating that is is uh, the network, the Sapphic Writers Network is creating spaces to have that and to encourage Sapphic writers. Um, and do you think you've seen a rise in people working in this space? Um, I think we are un 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 underserved, as you said. Yes. <laughs> but... I I think so. Um, before starting work with Sapphic Writers, um, I was definitely like in the scene, just checking things out. And on on our Facebook group, there's a whole slew of just people writing so many various stories that come from different backgrounds that you don't normally see in popular culture. So I think that, you know, what we're doing is definitely important because I mean we're uplifting people you know we we want to see the stories that we don't see told so you know having that sort of support and the resources to continue to do those things is important so I I love it and I I, I love seeing the work that's coming from it and being able to be inspired by that to continue to do my own work yeah 
I also love that the emphasis isn't necessarily that people have to write about the experience of being sapphic it's about being a community of people who are sapphic and writing yeah. um and actually i think it leads to a lot more imaginative and interesting approaches to writing um uh Zabib, in terms of your novel writing do you think that there's that fact that you come from a different lens just gives you a different way to enter a subject um yeah, I think, I hope so. Um, <laughs> uh, I, so I'm writing, um, trying to write um, a science fiction kind of psychological thriller that also has like a sapphic romance. Um, and they're definitely challenging. First of all, it's just a lot of things to have in a book. Um, <laughs> but uh, while well, a lot of elements of it, and you know, I'm, I'm working now on drafting the, the, through the first draft. I've gotten feedback that there's def like there could be more romance. So I'm wondering uh, like where I'm holding back because what I'm tr what I want to do is of course like we've been discussing um, there's so many ways uh, just straight stories get to be told um, and I wanted to create a book where it's not just focused on that aspect um, that they these characters get to be complex and have a lot. Uh, of other things going on and that this can be totally like normalized. Um, yeah, so that's that's hard, to, but also maintaining the romance. So yeah, that's that's something I that's really important to me. Definitely. Yeah, and um, on the romance note seems like a good point to come to Lola as uh, romance is quite key to Lola's four novels. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just, it seems an, an, an underserved is definitely a word that comes to, to mind there because romance is this huge part of the, the book industry in particular but um the percentages I can't remember off the top of my head but they're tiny for you know a romance between two female characters it's just almost crazy that you know there's such an imbalance um but I think the thing that that, that lesbian romance or sapphic romance has in particular going for it is one they have a couple of um, boutique really dedicated publishers both in America and in Europe who have really just been like you know what we're going to lose money but we're going to push through and we're going to we're going to get to a profit and we're going to get to those books are going to be out there and that's phenomenal so like I'm really lucky to be working with Elva here one of those um, but the other thing as well is that self-publishing has become so accessible uh, just kind of the right time I think as well where a lot of people we're like, I've got the story to tell. There might not be a big press that's ready to handle it yet, but we're getting them out there and we're proving that there's an audience. And, you know, everyone has their own attitudes to self-publishing and how they want to do that and how they want to interact with that. But um, I think, apart from anything else, the democratisation of the process, um, there is a lot of gatekeeping still in publishing. There's a lot of stories not getting through. Um, and every time someone does it, whether it's self published with a, a tiny indie press, and they get a story out there that gets popular it's like see we've been telling you we want these stories yeah. and we we love them you know so and, and romance for and i think it's the escapism is the biggest deal you know it's a tricky thing sometimes when you're plotting a story you're like oh i could put so much more conflict in here this would be so angsty and so you know oh everyone would suffer for a while but ultimately you know we're we want our beach reads we want our easy you know something to read before you go to sleep so that you fall asleep with a smile on your face and not, you know, having angst dreams about the characters because they're in trouble, you know. So... And you could also dream about tennis and ballet if you're reading yours, which yeah. I, or, or horses. <laughs> that, was the thing, that was the key. I think that's what made me believe I could finally write romance in the end is you've got to make them whole people. You've got to make them three, four, five dimensional characters, you know, who have wants and dreams and flaws. And that's, yeah, that's maybe the other benefit of it being own voices as well. I'm not scared to write a flawed sapphic character because I'm a flawed sapphic person. Um, whereas someone maybe coming from outside the community would be like, oh, I don't want to see negative things about this group of people. So everyone's this perfect saint who never does anything wrong. And, and you don't really get the conflict or the friction that way if, if everyone's too good. So. Yeah, you get the perfect saint who's had a traumatic past. Yes. <laughs> and they just get kinder and more perfect no matter how bad you are to them and, and that's exhausting to read to, to watch <laughs> after a while so. um, 
Sigrid, do you, um, do you, is there anything that you'd really recommend that you've seen more recently of like great examples of writing in this sphere? Oh, yes. I, it, I probably, other people will have heard of it. It's called Last Night at the Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe. And she's a Chinese American writer. I just, I coincidentally, I, her story takes place in 1950 in San Francisco, uh, about uh, 12 or 13 years before I lived in that area. And like her heroine, I dreamed of, uh, of walking in the shadows and going to the bars. And, but her heroine actually lives in San Francisco, San Francisco, unlike me, I lived in the suburbs. And she finds, uh, a, I think it's probably a fictitious lesbian bar and uh, when it, one of her classmates uh, agrees to go there with her and there's a drag king who sings. And I've, there, uh, there's much more to the story than this, just the way Lola says, they have to be whole people. And all the characters in Last Night at the Telegraph Club uh, are whole people, even, even the parents, even the villainous, who uh, shops uh, the heroine to the authorities? Uh, you you feel you uh, they're like people you might know. Uh, so that's one that I would really recommend. And Melinda Lowe uh, gives uh, appears on Zoom for the GLBT Museum in San Francisco and other groups. So uh, you might run into her. I'd also like to say that I. Uh, thinking about lesbian romance. At the time we were selling books, there was a publisher called Nyad in America, which was the largest lesbian publisher. Perhaps it's the largest lesbian publisher that has ever existed. The, and the Barbara Greer who founded it was criticized because uh, they didn't focus on quality always, though they did publish some things that were wonderful and that became were taken up by mainstream publishers, but she said, most of our readers are 16, and that's how I want it. The, uh, the books, uh, the glue in the books wasn't always very good. And I have a copy of This Is Not For You by Jane Rule that you have to read very carefully now, but people bought and bought and bought these books. And now that people are donating books to us, a lot of them are Nyad books. I hope that something like that returns. That would be great. Um, mass, mass popular fiction. Um, uh, I, I, I thought of another book that I really liked. I don't know if anyone else has read it. Uh, Fierce Femmes and Notorious Liars. Uh, I've heard of that, but I don't know it. It's um, um, a, about a trans street gang. <laughs> um, in a sort of magical, who have magic powers, um, because uh, the person who wrote it has a bit at the beginning where it's sort of like our stories are usually that we're brave or that we're dead, or that we're brave and dead. So I want to write a story where we don't have to be brave or dead. We can be criminals and we can have fun and we can be a gang raising hell on the streets. Um, and it, it's, it is really fun to read. <laughs> so I recommend it. <laughs> it sounds fun to read. Yeah. Um, so uh, what I want to do now is to move into the Q&A, um, see if anyone's put any questions in the Q&A section. We've got uh, a lovely comment in, um, in the chat, um, which is about um, just... Um, that was sent to all the panelists, which was all I wanted as a teenager was books that normalize sapphic narratives, not victimize or overly dramatize. The only place I found this was sci-fi, which feels like a good point to shout out Ursula Le Guin for this. Um, while it has its faults, I was so grateful for Ammonite. Sci-fi is still one of my favorite genres for new queer stories. Um, and I, I find it for in podcasts and stuff, it's mostly in the sci-fi genre that you actually get in these really great queer stories. But podcasts is a re great place for more represent representation that I've found, particularly narrative podcasts. Um, 
though the one that's springing into my mind at the moment is about gay men um so not not ideal for this setting but it's nice to see more of it i i could also shout out about elizabeth a lynn i really would like uh, more people to know about her now she is not the writer Le Guin was, uh, but she, uh, her books were the first uh, queer sci-fi that I ever encountered, though I think there was a lot uh, to discover. And uh, the biggest bookstore in the US, A Different Light, was named after her first novel, which it took place in a universe where it was perfectly okay to be LGBTQ and some people were, some people weren't and her, uh, her two heroes are gay men and there are lesbian characters as well. Then she wrote a sort of fantasy series with three volumes and the third one is called The Northern Girl and the heroine is lesbian. And she, she uh, after all this, in about 2005, she wrote some young people's books and then one day she said, she realized that she just had no more to say. So she uh, went back or continued with the martial arts. That's how she made her living and she's still living out there. But one of the things I'd really like to do is uh, publicize her novels because they deserve to live on. That's can you repeat great. her name? Yeah. Can, can you repeat her name, please? Elizabeth A. Lynn. Elizabeth L and the novel she, uh, she wrote that the three bookshops were named after was called A Different Light. Fantastic, that's so great. Um, at the moment, we have no questions in the Q&A. Um, I just say you can type them anonymously via the Q&A button. Oh, and just as I say that, a question appears. Fantastic. Um, uh, and it's a really interesting one. Um, I was wondering what you think of female only worlds in speculative fiction and the person who's asked this has said this is a selfish question as a non-binary <laughs> sapphic person I simultaneously love and hate them and would love to hear your views but also as a non-binary sapphic person I would love to hear your views from my selfish perspective about all female worlds in speculative fiction. Um, I will as someone who's also non-binary uh, I I have no quarrels about them because um, I mean I feel like for so long just just getting female-led stories was kind of hard to do especially ones that were so imaginative uh, and weren't catered to the male gaze so seeing you know women do all of these things that men have been doing in stories is fun um especially when like they're like they're not just dainty you know damsels in distress um but like they're having fun being bad uh you know they have these fleshed out uh narratives so i i have no problems with it um because i mean I, i'm sure one day there's going to be plenty of stories with people like me who are non-binary that are doing some far offlandish things so it's it's fine to me it's fine to me yeah i i would love to be an action i always wanted to be the really active like action heroine type ones they just looked like they were having so much fun like taking names and not feeling bad about it yeah yeah <laughs> like, that's an option excellent um <laughs> Do you do you feel do you feel the same way? Because um, obviously you're coming from a different perspective. Um, the rest of the panel, um, how do you feel about uh, speculative fiction with uh, all female worlds? Yes. Um. Yes, Sabine. <laughs> wasn't sure who the question was directed at. I was directing it at you generally, but you put your hand up, so I was like, "Yes, please speak." Oh, sorry. Because <laughs> okay, you were about to say something. Oh, China's Please, not saying you to go ahead. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I pretty much agree with China. <laughs> so <laughs> I think um, 
I can't say I've like read a ton of all female or watched a ton of all female world stories um, uh, in speculative fiction, um, if that's what we're defining it as. Um, so I think it's really intriguing. There's a lot of possibility to challenge our assumptions of um, what's possible uh, in certain worlds and to create new rules. So I like, even if I wouldn't write that, I, I think it's really intriguing. Yeah, I think the new rules ideas are really interesting. Um, have you read anything like that, uh, Lola or Sigrid? Um, I think uh, I, I'm not averse to sci-fi, I have to say, or to speculative fiction. Um, I just tend to, there's so much of it, I sometimes get a bit scared off of like knowing where to start. So it's always on a personal recommendation. It's always like, someone will say, you have to read this book. I'm like, yes, I will do that. <laughs> um, so I think like the interesting thing is um, there have been a couple of writers that have been like if not female only then certainly female led or female run societies have been a big part of them um, and I think that's kind of put the the impetus behind I think by isolating one gender and assuming there were only two to begin with shows you the limitations of that worldview just generally um, so it's been a real eye opener for me in terms of like needing an example to sort of express to people how like gender is a fluid thing and you know not everyone can be put in one or two neat little boxes. Um, so sometimes effectively removing one of those options from the, the sort of the arena makes you go all oh, right okay so well, what we would actually do is we would include everyone. Uh, you know, and we would stop making gender something to divide people by. Um, so actually it kind of, it puts into stark relief sometimes the need to, you know, stop restrictive views of gender rather than, um, it, you know, it's not really about that exclusivity. Um, and I think it's been quite a useful learning tool. And I think it's like, I see it in like kids maybe coming up a generation or two behind me now, they're so much more open-minded and so much more unfazed. It's not complicated to them. They're just like, yeah, that's, you know, I don't personally, you know, identify one way or, or the other, but I understand other people do. And it's just, such, it's so much more built in for them now. And it's hopefully a sign we're going in the right direction. Yes. Um, talking about kids has just reminded me that my friends recently um, explained what uh, transness was to their four-year-old. And their four-year-old understood that if you can change, if you can reject the gender that you're given, uh, assigned at birth, that... Um, that makes you a superhero. <laughs> so that is the four-year-old's understanding of trans yeah. transness. It's that it's a superpower. Which oh, that's amazing. Which well, I, I, I absolutely love. <laughs> oh yeah, I I I'm going to write that down. <laughs> um, I'm going to go back to the Q and A. So we've got a question, which is, what are the best resources to find out about new sapphic writing? And I'm going to say, one of the best resources is sapphic writers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean yeah I, come bother us on Twitter Facebook Instagram uh, you'll find something I mean uh, a lot of what I did before uh, finding sapphic writers was just putting in like keywords to things um, if I wanted to find something uh, just on Google okay let me find fat lesbian writers uh black non-binary authors just things like that where I mean I, I didn't know there's spaces held for them um until I just searched for them and there's so many things online now uh sadly but also not sadly because of uh the pandemic that you know these online spaces have grown um and become so much more accessible so yeah, we're, we're out there, but yeah, absolutely come bother us. We're always looking to give people information. Uh, so yeah. Um, and also um, as Robbie has handily just posted in the chat, you can also find all of our panelists um, <laughs> on social media and you can find, find their writing. Um, Sabib's had a quite a lot of poetry and articles published recently. As Lona said, four novels with two more on the way. Um, uh, and Sigrid also writes. It's not just Lavender Menace. Sigrid also writes. <laughs> so um, there are places to find them and what they're doing. 
um, as well as a link to the Sapphic Writers Group in been placed in the chat for people. Um, and I've got a lovely question, which I think might end up being our last question. Uh, what is everyone's favorite Sapphic focused book? which comes with, I need to add more to my reading list. And that's from Zara, who actually runs the Staff Pride Network book group. <laughs> I know, it's a bit of a putting you on the spot. <laughs> I'm going to cheat. I'm going to give you a recent favourite because all time is just too much. I, I love too many books. Um, but one book that blew me away was uh, The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. Um, you know when a, you know a book's good when you have to put it down like three chapters from the end and walk it off because you're, you're not ready for the end you know the end sequence is going to get you but yeah you have to you have to psych yourself up to to let it happen so as a fan it, it really doesn't look like what the title suggests everyone's like seven husbands what's the sapphic content and it's like aha <laughs> <laughs> let it trick you let it let it do that fantastic it looked like you had an answer prepared to be so I'm going to go to you next um, well, just because it was the first thing that popped into my mind, um, although it is a book, I think, with a lot of, like, trauma, and it's quite sad, sorry, um, Stone Butch Blues, which I read when I was, like, 20, um, I mean, that's a famous book, but it just it introduced me to a lot of things <laughs> um, and ideas, so I just, that book has always stuck with me. Oh, it's a classic. Like a true classic. Um, Sigrid, uh, can you can you narrow it down to one? Yeah. <laughs> um, that's not easy, but I've the one I'm stuck on just now is like last night at the Telegraph Club, but I it's by no means the only one. And this oh. is a soft book. It's I uh, by Eli Percy, and it's called Vicky Romeo and Jules, and it's I. Uh, she calls it, I'm uh, sorry, they call it a historical romance about Glasgow at the turn of the century. And it, uh, it's all about uh, dyke bar culture uh, as it was then. And it's the, the big thing about it is the voice in it. Uh, you can just hear the characters uh, talking. They, uh, they, uh, they, laugh at each other they provoke each other they uh everything is just one long conversation uh, but it it expresses their friendship as well as the romance element yes and here's another one uh, the miseducation of cameron post which i uh, does have some trauma but i uh, i think it's really important uh because i uh, it I've, one of the blogs I'm going to write is comparing it to Ruby Fruit Jungle and how in 20 years, I think I really more like 30 years, things have gotten more subtle and more complicated. And the, the heroine uh, is, grows up in a small town. And once you've read this book, you know everything about what it's like to grow up in American small town, what sweets they like, what crisps they like, uh, what I've uh, all about swimming and the sort of the that life is just soaked into the heroine's bones and uh, she doesn't want to give it up. So uh, the when she, when the religious uh, converters get a hold of her, they use that to make her feel that she can have uh, the life she grew up with. It's just that she has to give up uh, her attraction to women, which they try to persuade her isn't really part of her at all. But it's uh, it's quite, uh, the characters are very real as well. That sounds fantastic. Um, I will um, just quickly note Sabib's comments because they ended up going to all panelists rather than all attendees it's all right it's really easy in zoom so uh, Zabib mentioned that there were the there's two amazing Netflix shows with sapphic main characters which were of course cancelled after one season which are everything sucks and I am not okay with this and also the uh, Eli Percy has a new book out called Duck Feet which is also excellent and uh, its first print run sold out and it's having a new print run from the publishers and also that the movie of Miseducation of Cameron Post is also wonderful, but 
obviously the book's worth reading first. And now I'm going to swing to China for your favourite book or piece of writing. Um, I haven't been able to read much lately, but I read this short story uh, called First Kill uh, by V. E. Swab that's also getting turned into a Netflix series. Um, and it's a very, a very good short story about uh, these two teenagers. Um, one is a vampire and the other is a vampire hunter. Um, so there's a lot of tension and angst in just such a short amount of time. Uh, so I'm very excited to see how the short story plays out into a series. That's yeah. fantastic, thank you. And I was gonna, uh, I was gonna uh, from uh, being a poet standpoint, recommend I'm sure you've all heard of Andrea Gibson, but Andrea Gibson is one of my favourite spoken word poets and some of the poems really speak to me, particularly when talking about being a boyish, girlish, boyish, <laughs> that sort of in-between place. Um, so um, I think that is everything. So if you could all just round up with telling me what you're working on at the moment, where people can find you. Um, and I'm going to go China, Sabib, Lola and Sigrid, if that's OK. Yeah, uh, so uh, Sapphic Writers has a very busy last few days of this month. Uh, tomorrow, we are having a evening of trans joy at 7 p.m. BST. On Sunday, we have our zine launch at 7 p.m. So if you can come out and enjoy some wonderful writing and visual pieces. Um, and at the end of the month, we have a Q&A with a live band. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's what we have going on this month. That's fantastic. Um, and uh, Sabib, you're next. You're working on your novel, but there's plenty of other places we can find you before that comes out. Yeah, because that's not going to be for a while. <laughs> so um, yeah, so Twitter, which is uh, up higher, and I can also put my Instagram and website. And uh, yeah, so like new things I'm doing, I'm writing movie reviews for Spectrum Culture, which is this cool website. And also I'll be running um, this is for people of color. Um, uh, mental health and writing workshop um, because I'm also a psychiatrist. Um, so I'm running this workshop with the Scottish Fame Network on July 10th, I believe, or 11th, but you can find it on the website, um, the Scottish Fame Network, and I can put a link in there. So for people of color who want to come, there are probably some tickets. That's fantastic. Thank you. And then Lola and then Sigrid to finish us up. Um, yeah, I've got I said two novels off being edited at the moment. Um, one set in the world of American politics, and the other one kind of um, trying to mess with the British royal family in a very fictional way. Um, so yeah, super queer, super fun, super sapphic. It's all it's all going to be lighthearted and fluffy up to a point. Um, and other than that, I'm yeah very much active on social media, chatting away. So. Uh, Kili Wola on Instagram is where all the, the pretty cat pictures normally end up. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm generally around. <laughs> and Sigrid, if you could um, finish us off with uh, where people can find you and what you've been doing. Well, um, I, well on Tuesday the 29th at 7pm, uh, we're having a Sapphic event, uh, which is... Uh, in, in uh, LGBT health and well-being in Edinburgh and uh, Lavender Menace Archive are the co-sponsors. And uh, Ellen Golford, who uh, wrote uh, The Fires of Bride and Mall Cutpers uh, in the 80s. Uh, and she's also written another sapphic novel called The Dyke and the Dibbuk. Uh, she's uh, going to be in conversation with Elix Huang and they are a genderqueer performance poet. And uh, they're, uh, they're going to talk about identity and creativity and coming to Edinburgh uh, from other countries because Ellen is from New York and Elix is from Sweden. And if uh, our social media uh, has the uh, address for 
uh, Eventbrite tickets. They're completely free. And uh, uh, so that's our next event. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook, uh, Twitter at, at Menaces of 2019 and on Instagram and uh, on our website, which is lavendermenace.org.uk. Uh, you can read my blogs uh, about uh, all these books, both new and old ones. And uh, we put up uh, the things that we're doing in order to uh, find space for the archive and uh, hold events and make it a reality. That's fantastic. Um, I'll briefly self-promote. Um, I'm, I'm also a writer. You can find me um, online. Um, I am show and tell everywhere. Show, S-I-O for show, underscore and underscore tell, because that's how I, uh, I, I that's my way of letting people know how to pronounce show. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and it oh, seems to work. <laughs> Show and tell, yes, double L. Um, and I'm just going to post into the chat the Sapphic Writers Facebook page so that everyone can see it because um, I've been trying to put everyone's contact details and hopefully Robbie can add Lavender Menace because I've not done that yet. Um, and um, i just like to also mention that if you are a member of uh, the University of Edinburgh, we also have Rainbow Office Hours. Um, which are on Fridays where uh, there's a group of different people you can contact um, who have basically are offered to be someone you can chat with. So they're not offering counselling, it's just a peer-to-peer -peer chat about things that you're thinking about or caring about with someone from the group. And Sigrid, you have your hand up. Yes, well I, I think that that's a mistake. I'm just trying to put our social okay. media addresses in the chat. It's all right, Robbie has done that. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you um that's great and um i think with that i'm going to wrap it up um thank you so much everyone for coming i'd like to thank our panelists who have been as great as i hoped um i hope everyone's enjoyed the discussion and um this is my last event but um i look forward to seeing you when i am a guest i'm just a, i'm just an attendee at future events so thanks everyone thank you for having Bye. us Thank, Thank you, you so much. Great fun. Cheers. <laughs>